Okay, well, good morning. Good. Uh, there are some that are on morning time here. Good afternoon and good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Dave Shirley, faculty in Ag, Food and Resource Economics at Michigan State, and I lead PRCI. And I'm very pleased that we have uh, the STARS Plus Fellows Program as a key part of PRCI and its research agenda. This, as you all know, is your final uh, presentation webinar of the work that you've done under cohort two, we understand, we know that it's been fantastic work. Just got word a little bit earlier from, from Raul that their paper has been submitted and, and, and accepted actually for peer review publication. Um, just reflecting kind of the quality of work that you all are doing. So let me not go on long here. Very pleased to have you here. Um, I'm, I'm moderating on behalf of Chris Barrett of Cornell, who of course runs this program. You all know him very well. And, K and Kelsey Schreiber of Cornell, who um, Chris would probably say Kelsey runs the program. Anyway, together with the mentors, they make a uh, fantastic, you know, fantastic duo, duo, fantastic team doing this. And I know you all are, you know, have had a great experience in what you've done. So let's just dive in. I think you all have um, 35 minutes. Please try to take only 30 minutes to present, leave a bit of time for discussion, and then a little bit of overflow time at the end. We're going to start with the team from the Indian Institute of Technology and Indian Institute of Management. Their topic is Kitchen Garden, Nutrition, and Food Security. And Cheat Wanlaji, you're going to present on behalf of your team. So take it away. Thank you. Thank you, David. So I'll just share my screen. Okay. Uh, so I am Chitwan Lalji, and I shall be presenting on behalf of my team. And my teammates are Devyan Pakrashi and Shonak Thakur. And we are the IITK and IIMK team. And our mentors are Carolina and Andhvi from Colgate and Cornell University. So uh, we are mainly planning to present our work, which is titled Kitchen Garden, Nutrition and Food Security. This project has been funded by JPAL South Asia and IIT Kanpur. And uh, the follow-up survey has been uh, funded by Colgate University and Cornell University. So in our country, India, there is aggregate food surpluses, and there is rapid economic growth, which is happening. But still, there continues to be severe malnutrition, which still persists in our country. 30%, 38% of children under five years of age are stunted, 36% of the children are wasted, and 50% of the adult women, they are anemic. Our country is also going through a triple burden of malnutrition, where on the one hand, we have undernutrition, overnutrition, and deficiency in micronutrients, micronutrients such as vitamin A, vitamin B, C, uh, hemoglobin, etc. Our country has been adopt has adopted many measures such as the public distribution system, where the government gives subsidized food to people below poverty line. Then we have the midday meal scheme where uh, government gives food which needs to be delivered via the educational institutes, that is through schools, through government schools, food is delivered to the children. Then there is also distribution of folic acid pills through the Anganwadi to pregnant women. And currently the government is also trying to go with a you know, a scheme which is called the Potion Abhyan, which focuses on a one specific thing as well, which includes, you know, promoting kitchen garden adoption in our country in order to address the problem of malnutrition and also micronutrient deficiency. So this paper, we will try to we'll try to find what is the relationship between kitchen garden and food insecurity and whether we can try to find a causal effect of adopting a kitchen garden on food insecurity. So for this purpose, we shall be using an RCT where we shall be giving a kitchen garden focused intervention where we will provide the 
the our participant information on the importance of micronutrients and how to maybe how to raise a kitchen garden so small training shall be given of around one day and what we basically find in this whole study is that having a kitchen garden or probably giving this particular intervention has helped reduced has helped reduce food insecurity improve dietary diversity and micro nutrient intake in the treated households these are with the control group so a brief literature review uh, we conducted a brief literature review where we tried to see what are the studies which have tried to study the association between kitchen garden and nutrient deficiencies or you know uh, or uh, food insecurity whether there is an improvement in food security etc but however these studies have mainly been mere association and we can't take them as causal because these studies were done using secondary data where a person whether a person adopts a kitchen garden or not had some sort of self self selection bias so there was not much evidence as far as causal is concerned in these studies however a few studies have gone ahead and conducted an rct and have tried to establish causal evidences and they have found positive effects on diet nutritional status and empowerment of women among the among children and women and this has been mainly in south asia in a specific country nepal while another study has found no effect on household uh, household diets and this study has focused mainly on africa so there has been some evidences but there has been mixed evidences so we are trying to what is going to be the contribution of our paper is it is going to be a first causal evidence study in the indian context and we'll try to shed light on causal pathways through which kitchen garden improves nutrition and that could be through maybe dietary diversity has increased or maybe there has been a reduction in food insecurity and what we basically find is that there has been a larger benefit for the people who for households which was severely food insecure now the question here is how effective are kitchen gardens in combating malnutrition so for this we first take a nationally representative data which is the national sample survey which was conducted in 2011 12 to understand whether there is any correlation between having a kitchen garden and incidence of malnutrition or food insecurity and we do find that there is greater intake of micronutrients higher food intake and greater calorie intake if we look specifically at the summary statistics of the nss data we find that all over india there is adoption of kitchen garden and it is around 22% of the households who have adopted a kitchen garden however in the rural india there are around 32% of the population which has adopted a kitchen garden and our study is focused specifically in rural uttar pradesh where 17% of the households have adopted a kitchen garden so in order to understand whether there exist any association between kitchen garden adopting a kitchen garden and food insecurity indicators we run the following regression and we are specifically interested to understand whether this beta 1 coefficient is significant and what is the sign of it for this regression we have also controlled for state level fixed effects and the standard errors they are clustered at the district level now the main results are prob are mainly indicating that if we look at the maybe at the first uh, table first row first column we see that the individuals the households that adopted a kitchen garden had higher iron intake if you see for a overall india context even in the rural area as well as in the urban areas indicating that individuals who had adopted a kitchen garden had higher iron intake but this is a mere correlation and this cannot help us establish causality because there could be some sort of sample uh, some sort of self selection bias so for this purpose we all we tried to do a small rct so we saw found similar results even for folic acid intake vitamin a intake vitamin c intake magnesium and potassium intake so 
In order to establish causality, we went for an RCT and the main intervention focused on two specific things. One is we provided a small intervention where we tried to give information on the importance of a balanced diet. What is the importance of micronutrients? What are the different vegetables which have micronutrients? And in case you do not consume my, uh, these vegetables or in case you have a micronutrient deficiency, what are the kind of diseases you, your family, your children may go through? So we gave them a small information on this aspect. And this was followed by a one-day workshop, which was cost-free access to this particular workshop in order to, so that they could know how to raise a kitchen garden in their own house or near their house. So this particular intervention not only included information on how to raise a kitchen garden, but also how to make fertilizers, pesticides in their own home using homemade techniques. And this particular intervention was delivered by our NGO partner, which is Shramit Bhatt. So the RCT design is as follows. We have 1,800 households, mainly women, who have been randomly allocated to three groups. The first group is the treatment group, which got the small information session followed by a one-day training. The second treatment group got not only the information and training, but it also got a conditional cash transfer of around 200 rupees, which would be around uh, uh, $2.5, $5 around a conditional cash transfer for in case they adopted a kitchen garden. And the third group got no intervention and this is our control. Now the target audience in this particular intervention were married women between the age group of 18 to 49 who had at least one child aged zero to 10 years and who was willing to participate in the proposed program and had a small plot of land for kitchen garden within the premise of their house at the time of the intervention. Not only within the premise of their house, but also nearby. So if we look at the location, this is the map of India, the yellow area. Within this, the orange area represents the Uttar Pradesh state. And if you look at the black, spot, the black zone, that is the place where we had the intervention. So this black zone is Unnao and Kanpur district in Uttar Pradesh. And what we basically did was we told our NGO to give us a list of villages which where we could conduct the RCT. So they gave us a list of around 200 villages of Uttar Pradesh from which we randomly selected 90 villages. And within these, these 90 villages were randomly assigned to one of the Three, one of the two treatment arms and a control. Then post the village, post assignment of villages to the treatment and control groups, we made a list of around 40 women from each, um, from each village who met the following criteria. That is, they were married, aged 18 to 49, zero to 10 years of age, were willing to participate and had a small plot of land where they could go ahead with kitchen garden and the, uh, around 40 women were selected from the village. Of these 40, we randomly selected 20, village, 20 women from each of these villages. And post this, we gave the intervention. Now, if you look at the, uh, this is a small photograph from the region. The person giving the intervention is not from our, from our side, but from our implementing partner, Shramit Bharti. The timeline of the project was such, we had the listing in November, followed by a baseline survey in December. The intervention was given by the implementing partner in January, and we had a small verification survey in the month of March and April. The main reason for conducting the verification survey was because by the month of Jan January and February, they is usually a good time to go for cultivation of you know, uh, of products in our country in this particular specific zone. And post the verification where we verified whether an individual, whether a household has adopted a kitchen garden and uh, what is the type of kitchen garden that they have adopted, we post verification, we also conducted a full-fledged end-line survey followed by a follow-up survey and experiments 
in the month of October, November 2020. So during the, after the baseline survey was conducted, we did a small balancing test, which was done at the baseline. And the balancing dust test was done at the village level, the household level, the participant level, the participant's husband characteristics and the child characteristics as well, and our major outcome variables such as food insecurity, food experience, food insecurity, experience scale, household dietary diversity, et cetera. And we found the uh, coefficient to be insignificant, indicating that the balancing had been done properly. After this, we went for an empirical strategy, which is as follow. We ran a simple OLS, uh, an ordinary least square, where T1i is the treatment group one, which got the information and the one day training. T2i is, is the treatment group, which got the intervention training along with a conditional cash transfer. And we also controlled for block level fixed effects and the standard errors were clustered at the village level. Our YI variable are our main outcome variables, which we will discuss subsequently as well. So this is in the treatment groups, the output that we saw, we clicked a few photos of it and which are available here. If you look at the summary statistics, we can see that our main outcome variable are the, as follow. One is incidence of food insecurity, that is whether they were food insecure or not. In the control group, after the intervention, this information is only of the end line survey, the control group, in the control group, nearly 40, 41% of the households were food insecure, while in the treatment group one and two, nearly 15 and 14% of the individuals were food insecure. If you look at the severely food insecure, the, there were nearly 25% of the sample which was severely food insecure in the control group, while there was no food, in, food severely food insecurity in the two treatment groups indicating that food, severe food insecurity is something that we can target through raising of kitchen guard. If you look at the food, insecure, food, in, uh, food insecurity experience scale, it was also higher in the control group relative to the treatment group. And nearly, um, uh, if we look at the adoption rate, nearly 46% of the individuals in treatment group one adopted a kitchen garden while a similar figure was observed for the treatment group two. If we look at the regression output results, we find that the individuals which got the training and the individuals who got the training plus the CCT, the nutrition knowledge index and the kitchen garden knowledge index, that is we conducted a small quiz of around 10 questions each, uh, on nutrition knowledge and KG, kitchen garden knowledge, which was the intervention content of the intervention, we found that it was more or less similar for both the groups. If we look at the self-assessed kitchen garden, that is an individual was asked whether they have a kitchen garden or not during the verification phase, nearly 46% reported that they had in the, three, in the two treatment groups and the coefficients are statistically insignificant. I mean, the difference is not uh, statistically significant, indicating that if we give an additional conditional cash transfer, it has no additional effect on the adoption rate. And similar observation was observed when we looked at the enumerator assessed kitchen garden. So somebody, one person from our side, from the survey team, and one person from the NGO had gone to do a small verification where they themselves assessed whether the kitchen garden was, uh, you know, had been adopted or not. At this point, I think I can also make one thing clear that the adoption of a kitchen garden or not, which was done by the enumerator, was done on very strict conditions. And those conditions were that the person has to have a certain amount of size of land and has to have some crops that are produced of vegetables and fruits which are produced, which can be used for consumption. And not, it didn't include just maybe one papaya tree or maybe uh, a small area of, uh, you could say spinach that has been grown. It has to be a full-fledged kitchen garden. Now, if we look at the area under kitchen garden, we find that the, treat, the two treatment groups had higher area under the kitchen garden and 
the enumerators they also conducted a small assessment that means they went and conducted a small verification to understand and grade the you know the kitchen garden on a scale of 0 to 100 on certain parameters and they found that the score was higher for the people for individuals who belong to the training group and the training and the cct group and if we look at the wall test, we find that it is statistically not significant, indicating that given that additional conditional cash transfer doesn't have any additional effect on adoption of kitchen garden and also maybe the sensitivity of the kitchen gardens. So next, we also try to see, uh, uh, we try to observe what is the effect on the incidence of food insecurity and we found that both the training groups had lower incidence of food insecurity vis-a-vis -vis the control group and the coefficients were more or less similar, indicating that the incidence of food security reduced in both the groups to the same extent. Next is, interestingly, we also found that severe food insecurity has decreased in both the groups. And in fact, this kitchen garden got the severely insecure individuals in, the treat, in both the treatment groups to almost zero. If we look at the food, insecure, food, in, uh, food insecurity experience scale, we find that the, both the treatment groups had lower experience of food insecurity relative to the control group. Interestingly, we found that the dietary diversity was higher in both the groups. Now, the main reason we took dietary diversity was because in our country, we are also having a condition of micronutrient deficiency, which could be probably one possible way of reducing that is through diversifying your consumption basket or diversifying your food items in the uh, consumption aspect. And we find that yes, there is a diet increase in dietary diversity. Interestingly, when we conducted the wall test, we found that the dietary diversity was higher in the conditional cash transfer group vis-a-vis -vis the non-conditional transfer group, that is the treatment group one. Indicating that if you are giving that additional cash transfer, it may not have an effect on food insecurity, uh, any additional effect on food insecurity and severely food insecure, but it has an additional effect on the dietary diversity of the households, of the treated groups. Now, within the dietary diversity, we wanted to see in different items, which, it which food item is having, uh, maybe is there any difference in the training and the training plus the CCT group. Interestingly, we found as far as vegetables are concerned, uh, there is higher consumption of vegetables in both the treatment groups. And if we look at the vitamin A rich vegetables, there is higher consumption, uh, there is higher consumption of uh, vegetable food groups, vitamin A rich vegetables, dark green leafy vegetables, and other vegetables. And if we look at the fruits aspect, we find similar results. But if you look at food items which are little more expensive, like for example, meat, meat egg, fish, and legumes, we find that in the group which got the conditional cash transfer, the effects were higher vis-a-vis -vis the control group and the group which got the only training group. So indicating that although the conditional cash transfer doesn't have any additional effect on reducing the incidence of food insecurity, but it helps to diversify the consumption basket and in which particular direction it is more in the direction of the expensive food items such as meat, beef, meat, egg, fish, and legumes. So in order to establish a, a external validity, we also use the NSS data, which is a nationally representative data from where we started our uh, introduction to this particular uh, paper. And what we did was within this NSSO data, we took a small the sample which included women who were aged between 18 to 49 and who had children, at least one child between the age group of zero to 10. Because that was our, uh, because that was our criteria for selecting the women in the RCT. And with that some sample, we conduct, we did, we ran a regression to understand whether there is correlation between kitchen garden adoption and uh, micronutrient deficiencies and incidence of 
food insecurity. Interestingly, we found the results to be similar. However, the NSS uh, NSS module has a food consumption table, which is quite exhaustive. And we tried to mimic the same uh, exhaustive table for our RCT, but we are still uh, you know, in the process of cleaning the data of the food consumption table. And we plan as a next step to match and see whether the coefficients that we got from the kitchen garden, our kitchen garden intervention and the NSS data, are they similar or they are very different? Now, the next thing is, I think a small conclusion could be, so the cost of intervention which we had per household was around $5.5, but that was the cost to a small NGO, which was located in a small place. So if the government does it at a large scale, probably this kind of an intervention could be very efficient in reducing food insecurity and specifically severe food insecurity. So in our country, definitely growing some food, everyone growing some food is inefficient, but India is a food surplus country. So it is very important that, you know, maybe there is some distribution, you know, you could say uh, there is some distribution uh, probably loopholes, which probably is difficult to address, or we don't really, I mean, that's not the part of the paper, but that could be a possibility. So an easy way out could be probably that we could go for maybe giving interventions where we provide them knowledge on how to raise a kitchen garden and importance of a balanced diet, importance of micronutrients. So the main conclusion is that we conducted an RCT to, which was specifically nutrition focused intervention and this intervention focused on training and explaining the benefits of not only micronutrients but also how, help them understand how to implement a kitchen garden in their plot, small plot of land in their house or nearby and interestingly we found that yes it does have an effect the treatment groups had higher food security, higher micronutrient consumption, and better dietary diversity vis-a-vis -vis the control group. Uh, but the conditional cash transfer didn't have any additional benefits as far as adoption of kitchen garden is concerned and food insecurity is concerned. But in the dietary diversity, definitely it did have an effect indicating that the conditional cash transfer can help improve the dietary diversity, but the dietary diversity is improving more from the point of view of high cost uh, food items such as meat, egg, fish, and etc. So that's all from our side. Thank you so much. Okay, Chitlan, uh, thank you so much. Very, very relevant topic. Um, very nice and clear design on what you did. Um, very interesting and policy relevant results, it seems to me. You went into the cost effectiveness of this as well. So this should be of great interest to policymakers. I have several questions, but I would like first to turn it over to everyone else, the mentors and the other fellows on, 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 on this uh, call and see if we have any questions. Please go ahead. I do see one hand up, Rainer, please go ahead, Rainer. And you are mute, there you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, th thank, thank you very much. It's a, it's a very interesting paper. I think the design is uh, quite convincing, at least in terms of internal validity. It's quite convincing. Uh, I, I just have uh, a couple of questions on the bigger picture of it. First of all, I don't know if India is really considered as a country where food, access to food is an issue. India is known to produce surplus food and even exports quite a lot to other developing countries. So I just wonder whether it's, it's, it's in terms of the context, how really relevant this study would be. I have no doubt that if you did this study, for example, I come from Cameroon or any other African country, it would be extremely relevant. And a lot of people would like to to, to read the paper, or, yeah. But I, I just wonder if India really would be catchy as far as this this uh, this paper is concerned. I think the results are quite clear. I, uh, but again, I don't find them surprising. I'm sorry to say that. I, I don't find it catchy. I don't find it, it doesn't move me in the sense that uh, 
of course, if you provide training to, 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 to households, they are more likely to adopt certain practices. In this case, you provide the training and then they adopted a kitchen garden, which is more or less obvious to me. And then secondly, the fact that the, the additional arm of treatment, the, the cash transfer in itself, it doesn't really add much other than the fact that it adds to, it induces uh, dietary diversity. Again, I, I don't know if that is surprising. This simply points to the fact that when they have more money, they can buy maybe more, they can eat more diverse food. They can buy food that is more expensive, probably things that they cannot grow. When you show the results, we saw that I think they consume a lot of fish and meat and egg and things like that. It's just obvious to me in the sense that they don't, uh, they don't grow those things. So if you give them additional cash, they will buy them from the market. I think the bigger picture, the way I look at it, it's more of a logistics issue. That is the ability to move food from where it is abundant to where it is needed. I think that's, that's the big issue that India might be facing. It's, it's, it's a, around the logistics. That's, that's the issue. I don't really, I don't really know to what extent this is scalable and what the macro impact would be in terms of if the government is giving five, I think 5.5 USD to, it, it will be millions of persons at the end of the day. And I don't know how sustainable this is. So it, it's a pretty good paper. I just feel like I, I would have loved to work on such a paper for a typical developing country, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, probably done in India. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Reno, for your question, uh, for, you know, the comments. So first thing is, you rightly pointed out, our country has food surplus. But on the contrary, we also have the other side of the story where we have severe malnutrition, stunting, wasting of almost 36%, right? So that still exists. So despite being a surplus country, sending, ex exporting our food grains to other countries, we still have the issue of malnutrition. So probably, as you pointed out, there is this logistic issue that is happening, right? And our government is also giving a lot of, you know, it has a lot of schemes. Like, for example, it has a public distribution system where food is provided to individuals who have, are below poverty line at a subsidized rate, right? And maybe they, ha they also have a scheme like the midday meal scheme where children who come to school are given food for free in government schools, right? And... So despite these schemes being in place, despite our country being a food secure, food surplus country, despite it exporting food, the excess surplus food, we still have this issue of malnutrition in our country. We still have food insecurity. So the problem here is probably, as you pointed out, that the food is not being, or probably that it's the distributional effect which is coming to the picture. So the main focus of our study is to understand that whether can we provide a simple kitchen garden information dissemination and would that help improve this food insecurity issue? So I hope that answers your question, Reno. Yeah, it does, it does, yeah. And uh, regarding the second question that you asked, uh, so in some countries they have found causal evidences like in Nepal, but in some countries in Africa, they have done an intervention where they have given the information on how to raise a kitchen garden in Africa, and they have found insignificant results. So we basically wanted to understand what is happening in our country. Maybe what looks obvious may not have, maybe providing the information and adoption are two different things. So we just wanted to understand whether providing that information could help in the adoption as well. Okay, good questions, excellent answers, uh, Cheat One. We have time for one more question, I would say, in this. Any more questions from any of the participants? Okay, I see uh, some hands up. I'm going to the list. Okay, Dina, please go ahead. Dina, you are muted. Dina, can you unmute yourself? Okay, let's let's go then to um okay, go Hello. Dina, there you go. Can you hear okay, me? okay, thank you. 
much. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. I just have a short uh, question. I just want to understand, maybe I missed when she was presenting. I just want to know uh, the frequency of uh, distributing those uh, cash handouts to the households. Mm -hmm. Because I wonder, it has. Uh, it seems it has the. It has a uh, great impact on on the food security and uh, consumption of expensive food like meat and the like. So I just wanted to know the frequency mm -hmm. of. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Dina. I'm sorry I did not mention it, but uh, yes, uh, the frequency was just a one time, and that was not during the intervention and not during the verification. So first we give the intervention. We had a small verification. And, but during the intervention, we told them that in case we find that you have adopted a kitchen garden, we will give you, we will give you a cash transfer. And that cash transfer was given at the end line after the whole survey was done. So basically, probably the uh, inference that maybe we can draw is that you expect some additional cash in the future, and therefore you're going for some dietary diversity in the current uh, in the current uh, time period. Uh, Dina, does that answer your question? Okay, uh -huh. thank you very much. Thank you, Dina. Okay, let me let me squeeze now uh, Semeni Ngozi of Michigan State in. Last brief question, please, Semeni, and brief, brief answer, then we'll move on to the next presentation. Um, Laji for nice presentation. I have some suggestions, especially on the summary statistics. The one that you presented the, for the participant in the, the treatment group, because you just presented the, some summary statistics, some descriptive statistics. So I was suggest, suggesting that it's better if you do a T statistics, T test, you know, you do a test, a T test comparison between the control and the treatment group. So that one is going to give us, you know, a full picture of the significance of the differences between the two groups. You have a control with the other group, then the control with the next group, then the control with the, the last group. But then I have a question in terms of the cost effectiveness, because you told us that, you know, the program costs around $5. So I wanted to know how you measure the cost effectiveness, you know, to know that this program or what you have been, you know, doing, intervening in terms of the food security, in terms of, you know, providing people with the seeds so that they, they plant, you know, the kitchen gardens, how effective it is so that in the near future, people can, you know, adopt the kitchen gardens. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simi. So summary statistics, we definitely include the T-test, as you have suggested, the T-test tables. For the Cost, I, we had measured the cost that that NGO had incurred per household for giving the information. We did not give the, the treated groups, the seeds or fertilizers. We did not give anything. We just gave them the information and the training. No seeds, no fertilizers were given. So this is basically the cost that was incurred by the NGO per household, which has been reported. So it is around $5.5, which is for an NGO for a small place. So probably we want, what we meant was that if a government does it on a large scale, probably that cost could go down further as well. Okay, very well done. We're gonna move on. Excellent job, Cheat One. Thank you so much. We're going to move on to the University of Buea, land market responses to weather shocks, evidence from rural Uganda and Kenya. Um, Rainer, I think you said that someone else was uh, presenting on, on your behalf. Please take it away, whoever's presenting. Hello, Rainer. Can you indicate who will be presenting? Raul, Raul, I think you're up. Okay, there we go. Okay, we see your slides. Thank you. Uh, with uh, the two mentors, Catherine Ragasa and uh, Alex Nishida, we are we work on the topic title. Uh, land market responses to weather shocks evident from uh, rural Kenya and Uganda. Uh, in our 
introduction. Sorry, I have some. Sorry. So Raul, we do no. So, so yes, I'm uh, yes, I'm trying to. There we go. We see yeah, it in okay. slide show mode. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. In our uh, introduction, uh, basically, uh, we should understand that uh, agriculture in the both countries, Kenya and Uganda, is predominantly rain-fed and is dominated uh, by uh, smallholder farmers, in which the agricultural sector uh, contributes significantly to the uh, household income. And the fact that the agricultural sector is predominantly rain fed, it exposes the agriculture to climatic risks, which is also thereby uh, expose the household into food insecurity and poverty, and also uh, at need the ability to invest in other sectors, such as health and education. Uganda and uh, Kenya of recent have suffered more frequent drought, flood, and uh, other extreme climatic events in the past years. And this has resulted into uh, food uh, uh, unavailability, the increment in the prices and the crop failures, as well as the increase in the prevalence of the malnutrition. Why do we embark to this study? Because uh, there is a little evidence on land market responses to weather shocks, especially in the subsistence economy, where land is relatively unevenly distributed, and the agricultural cultivation skills is also very low. And the non-farm possibilities are also scarce, given that the the small nature of the of the economy, and the farmers always are always faced with the weather shocks. This study is also relevant because uh, the land market provides an avenue for rural uh, household to adjust the size of their land only response to the weather shocks, as well as the the, the participation to land market can generate financial resources needed to support uh, other well-known weather shocks adaptation such as migration. Why do we choose Kenya and Uganda? Both countries have a, a similar agroclimatic condition. Access to irrigation remains also very low. And the both countries rely heavily on the rainfall agriculture. Uganda and Kenya are also have some similarity in terms of crop production, in which maize and banana are the main crop grown by the smallholder farmers, though the land tenure is a bit uh, quite different in, in important ways. For instance, compared to Kenya, the land tenure in Uganda is dominated by customary tenure practices, such as uh, communal uh, ownership, though uh, it changes or dwindling, uh, land borrowing is still practiced in Uganda, but not in Kenya. And lastly, the non-farm sector is much more developed in Kenya than in Uganda. And on the whole, Uganda and Kenya provide an interesting setting to study land market, given that uh, the, the two, two countries have uh, such sim sim similarity that I did mention above. Our, st our study is timely for at least two reasons. Uh, firstly, why uh, many climate change models forecast uh, profound changes in precipitation and temperature in most parts of the world. Uganda and Kenya are already experiencing profound changes in rainfall and temperature pattern. Secondly, our study build on a small and growing literature by suggesting that the land market participation will offer uh, additional coping strategies for rural households in other parts of sub saharan part of Africa. How do we conceptualize this work? We, we consider the work following uh, the work of uh, Bliss and Stem, who I precise that uh, decision to participation in uh, land market depend on the optimal Household farm size at the given input and output price, and, the, and also at the household endowment. And the decision to participate are basically three whether renting, rent out, or not to power, or not the participation, which is the otaki situation. The model was, uh, uh, the study was modeled uh, as follows where our dependent variable, it is the continual measure of the size of the land, net of land was rented in, bought in, or purchased by the household in different villages. In the same, in the same equation, we have some uh, uh, variable like the household participation apart from the weather show variable, which were uh, drought and the flood. 
and the household uh, characteristics such as the height of the family, the family, the age, the years of schoolings, and as well as the value of the total asset. And we estimated the equation using both uh, using the household fixed effect, and we also check the robustness by looking by also using a different model to compare and see how the result looked like, which was estimated with the Tobit uh, regression. Now, uh, given that uh, less than 20% of the household in our data participate in land market, we also report the Tobit estimate as I as I mentioned earlier, and uh, alternatively, household fixed uh, fixed uh, effect model. We follow the, the Mondak and the Chamberlain. And in adding the household level time average for all the time variant uh, model. And then in, in the in the bid to assess the severity of the weather shocks variable, we also use uh, uh, the same equation to estimate the impact of the exposure to the weather shock on the income from a different sources, notably uh, crop, livestock, and the, uh, the non-farm uh, income. We use uh, also look at the some mechanism through way through which the, the exposure to drought and wet episode will affect the land market participation, and then uh, we, uh, we also look at it in which uh, we have the, the coefficient of interest. We measure the, the effect of the, the contemporaneous and the lack of exposure to drought and the wet episode on the rental uh, price per hectare, and look at also an indicator of the out of migration. In the household data, uh, we use the, long, the longitudinal household and uh, community data collected from the uh, rural Uganda and Kenya as part of the longitudinal rural household panel survey called uh, REPEAT. And we use also the, panel, the balance panel data for 647 and 629 in rural households respectively in Uganda and, and, and Kenya. And then, which was consulted from the the baseline uh, for the interview that was conducted in in 2005, and 15 in Uganda, and with the attrition rate of 30 percent in Kenya, where the survey of 2004, 2012, and 2018, and the attrition rate was 16 uh, percent. In terms of the construction of the the weather shocks variable, we focus on the daily precipitation and the temperature data obtained from the prediction of the World Energy Resources Project, which is power hosted by the NASA. And uh, we also, and the data were consulted from the year 1983 to the near present. And the monthly uh, temperature and the precipitation were generated from the a standardized presentation evapotranspiration index SPI for all the communities villages cover uh, in the household survey, and you should know that uh, the SPI is, cal is calculated from the historical presentation temperature, uh, which recorded so for any of the of the location, and the value of the SPI, uh, the positive value of SPI represent a wet uh, condition, and the negative value represent a drought a drought uh, condition. The, the probability of the risk of exposure of, of, of uh, originally uh, dry shock is represented between the ratio uh, the number of the years in which the SPI was below the threshold of minus one over the number of the years preceding the reference period, which was uh, 1983. And uh, similarly, it was done also through Calculate uh, the for the uh, unusually uh, uh, wet uh, shocks, but there the threshold is of, of one over the total number of years preceding the reference periods. In terms of, of result, the summary statistic as uh, shown, we try to uh, summarize uh, following the uh, basic indicators, which were three, where we scale into Zarita into three key indicator income, or the, in which we use that to measure the look at the welfare, the demographic characteristic, and the weather shocks. As uh, you can see, uh, most likely uh, the color in red represented the highest mean across the years of the survey. For instance, look at the per adult uh, income, 
2005 in Uganda and uh, 2012 in Kenya, which has the, the highest mean. This was done uh, across the various indicators, as I said, from the income, demography, and the, uh, and the weather shocks. In terms of the trend of the land market uh, in Uganda, following the specific uh, characteristic that we also look at as the term of uh, land holding, in terms of the participation in the last 12, uh, 12, 12 months, looking at the various indicators, uh, the highest mean was also a color in red, in which, for instance, you can look at the size of land assessed in hectares. Uh, in Uganda, the, the peak was in 2005 with uh, 2.89, where that shows that uh, in terms of access, that's, that shows the period through which, uh, in which the, the household uh, has the highest access to land across uh, the study period. Now, looking at the impact of the uh, rainfall shock, on the income, we first uh, uh, analyze it. Uh, uh, analyze it uh, this is using the household fixed effect model, uh, in which uh, the exposure to drought uh, significantly affected the income, but livestock income, the revenue from the livestock uh, uh, sector, that sh sh showing that uh, the drought uh, like increases the household, the livestock income for the smallholder in Uganda. Whereas uh, if the uh, lag two, uh, looking at uh, two years back, the uh, negative uh, uh, relationship occur. But this could be at the result of the extent to which uh, the, the drought affected the smallholder in the activities. That, but uh, we also noticed that as far as the access to credit is concerned, the access to credit uh, obviously increases the livestock uh, uh, income. Uh, that shows that the access to credit provided uh, some other means uh, that enable the smallholder uh, uh, farmers to uh, uh, provide the necessary uh, input for the activity and thereby uh, increases uh, their income. In Kenya, we almost have this, the, the opposite results because the exposure to drug in Kenya negatively affected the livestock uh, uh, income. Uh, that the different the pattern could be due maybe to the, the, the organization of the market and, and, and so on, other factors that may surely jeopardize and maybe affect uh, the various activities that could lead to reduce maybe the activities and thereby affect the, their income. Now, looking at the impact of the uh, rainfall shock on the land, land market, when we look at uh, the case of Uganda, with the focus in the last, last uh, 12 months, where we consider uh, several elements, we also notice that the, the weather shock, especially the drought, uh, negatively af affected in terms of boring. Uh, do that, this could be explained because the more drought, the less uh, 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 propensity to, or uh, the less willingness to, to embark into the agricultural activities. Whereas in terms of, of, of purchase, it, it increases. And this could be due to the fact that with the, 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 with the extent to which the drought affects the sector, there is, there, is, there is willingness for the farmers to sell at whatever cost. And then because the price could be low, that could increase uh, the purchase. When we look, also look at how the flood almost have the similar result in Uganda, uh, looking at uh, the highest, the higher the, the, the flood, the lesser the probability to borrow the land. And this could also be explained as it was explained in terms of drought. However, the exposure to the flood in, uh, in terms of, of selling has, is also reduced because given that uh, if they are not uh, uh, borrowers, automatically they can be uh, uh, potential uh, sellers and, and, and buyers. That is why uh, it's also have a, a negative uh, uh, relationship. Uh, in terms of accessibility to credit, the access to credit uh, provides uh, means and income to have uh, access to land, and it, it could be used to borrow and also it might, and or to purchase. Even that uh, the credit provides the, the basic capital, in which uh, uh, farmers, if have access to it, 
well, whatever condition are able to have a capital act to enable them to either to rent or to purchase a land. That's the case in, in Uganda. But then uh, when we now look at it a bit with uh, the other model that was the Toby estimation that was used uh, to maybe to check the robustness and other thing, and uh, with the to compare to see whether with the household fixed effect model with almost half the similar results. And uh, uh, this is why we use the, the Toby model, uh, the the household fixed effect model, which has which was more robust than the Toby estimation. In the case of the case of, of Kenya, we almost uh, also have uh, the similar pattern. In the, the drought reduces the the the, the, the reduces the probability to sell to buy the land or uh, to sell it because the more drought, the less buyers, and automatically it has a significant effect on that. Access to credit has significant effect given that it provides a mean of capital and uh, it could be used to rent it or to get the credit, but reduce it, uh, rent out in the sense that access to credit could be, could also provide source to, of income of uh, capital that could be used to diversify the activities, which could be non-farm. That is why in terms of rent out, the, 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 there is a negative uh, relationship. In the, using the double regression, is, we have almost the similar results. And now looking at the different pathway through which uh, the climate shock will uh, affect uh, uh, the rural household in Uganda uh, and, and Kenya, we look at uh, the effect in terms of the rental fee and in terms of uh, migration. In Uganda, the uh, weather shock or uh, rainfall shock has no significant effect, whether on rental or migration, whereas in, in Kenya, it has a positive and significant effect. That shows that in, in Kenya, the uh, dramatic uh, shock, uh, especially rainfall, has a significant effect in Kenya than the Uganda. We can draw uh, the main conclusion that the weather shocks significantly affect the land, the land market participation, but specifically the exposure to rainfall shock episode has a differential effect on the land market and income in the, in the two countries. And uh, what we could also conclude is that in both countries, access to credit uh, play a key role in defining the household land market response to the rainfall shocks. The household with access to market uh, to credit respond to rainfall shocks by acquiring more farmland through uh, increased participation in land rental and sale market. And uh, the pathway also suggests that exposure to rainfall shock has an impact on the uh, land rental prices. And there's also some evidence that uh, similar to grain reserve and livestock, land market can provide an avenue for household to respond to the weather shocks. In terms of recommendation, uh, effort uh, uh, to enhance the rural uh, uh, participation in the land market by strengthening and clarifying the land rights, which will be completed by the policy to enhance uh, access to credit and boost the on and uh, off farm activities for the potential development of the agricultural sector in both Uganda and Kenya. And this could also uh, stimulate the rural development. In terms of the outcome for this study, the article was uh, accepted for publication uh, in the European Review of uh, Agricultural Economics just a few days ago, the day before yesterday, on the 6th, February 2023. Uh, before we, uh, we round up uh, with the, probably the presentation, we want to, we are thankful the, for the mentorship provided by the Star Plus Fellow Program. Uh, we are also uh, thankful to the Department of uh, Agricultural Economics and Business the Faculty of Agriculture and Veterinary Medicine University of Boya for their support uh, throughout, throughout uh, this program. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Raul, very much. Um, yeah. So yeah. there's a lot to unpack in what you presented. You all did a ton of work. You did lots of regressions um, and you presented tables that had lots of numbers. So this is not a comment on the research itself, but I would strongly encourage you in future presentations to build your tables around your points, right? Decide what your points are, 
decide what the essential information, essential results are to focus your listener's attention on those points and provide them the evidence to believe what you're saying, right? Okay. Um, and then do that. Because when we have uh, tables with so many numbers in them, it becomes very, very difficult for the listener to, I mean, for the listener to understand and really take away the point that you're trying to make. So while the paper, I'm sure, is excellent, it went through peer review, it was published, I'm sure it's made a, an important contribution. In terms of an audience that's listening, please do in the future simplify your presentation and build it really around uh, the points that you're going to make. Okay, that's okay, my thank you. My, okay. yeah, my suggestion in terms of how to present. Let me thank open it much. up to um, uh, any questions. I don't see any hands up. Rainer, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, that advice, that comment. I, I just want to uh, drive down one very important point. I think Raul touched on it. I just want to reemphasize it. The, the main uh, issue uh, which this paper had to address in the process of in the review process, it's the fact that rainfall shocks or climate shocks or weather shocks are these these are aggregate shocks, in the sense that they affect entire communities. And then the the reviewer's main issue was that, given that land markets are finite, given that land transactions in Uganda and Kenya mostly take place within communities. And given that these shocks are aggregate shocks, what then drives transaction after a shock? That, that's the point. Because if the shock occurs, all the households are affected, they do transaction just within the community, what then, what, what the, 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 the transaction we're seeing in the land market, what drives it? That has been the main issue in this paper. And then uh, the main point is that the underlying factor is differential access to credit households that have access to credit and in the paper credit is measured prior to credit predates it is lacked in such a way that it predates the shock itself of course it is possible that previous shocks long time ago might be driving credit that, that's a limitation but basically differential access to credit drives land transaction within communities as a result of a shock so basically households that have access to credit they take advantage of a shock. When there is a shock, they buy land, uh, they do acquire land because some of these houses, the poorer households basically sell off their land, they rent out their land, and they probably uh, move into the off-farm sector. While households that have access to credit do take advantage of these shocks and acquire land through greater participation in land markets. That's, that has been, that's the mainstay of the paper. I think Raul made this point quite clear. I just thought it important to, uh, to, to drive it down one more time. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, Rainer. I don't see any other hands up. If there aren't any hands up, what I would like to do, I'm still not seeing any. It, it was hard to see that point clear, frankly, in the presentation. So I'm wondering if perhaps Raul could take us back to the table that has those results and, 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 and show us how consistent that finding is that you're highlighting, Rainer, that 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 access to credit drives a consistent uh, direction of effect in terms of use of land markets. Could you do that? And then that would let us, at least in this presentation, clearly see how the results support one one clear outcome. Thank you. I think Raul, you can. Uh... Yeah, I think this is just one of the tables for the robustness analysis. And then if you look at this table, yeah, you can even stop here as well. I think it's, it's fine. You, you can stop here as well. Yeah, Raul, can you, can you come down? I think you're quite... Yes, you can stop here. This, 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 it's fine. Any, any of the tables, it's okay. So if you look at the, on the first column, the outcome variable is uh, a dummy indicator of participation. That is renting in land. It takes one if the household participated. Raul, can you just go back to that table? Can yes, you just go back like upward? There. Yeah, you can stop here. Can, can you just stand? Can you just stop here for a while, Raul? So if you look at this table, you will discover that 
the first column, the, the outcome variable is a The first column, the outcome variable is a dummy indicator of, uh, of renting in. So basically it takes one if the household is a, is, is a tenant that is it, it, it rented in land. Renting in land means the household is virtually expanding its scale of production. And then you can see that uh, the indicators of the weather shocks themselves, they don't really affect. There's no significant impact of the weather shocks, be it the, the drought or the flood or their lag values. They don't significantly affect renting in. But if you look at the interaction terms where we interact the weather shocks and the uh, access to credit, you'll find that, uh, for example, access to credit increases uh, uh, the likelihood of a household participating as uh, a tenant by uh, almost 10 percentage points. It's, of course, it's borderline is significant at 10 percent. And then if you look at the other tables, you will still see similar results. If you go down and you look at purchase, one, if purchased, if the household purchased land, you can see again that if the household is exposed to a weather shock and the household has access to credit, it is more likely to purchase land. So across these tables, it's, it's the same story. Weather shocks and exposure to credit leads to greater participation in land markets. If, if, you, if you go through all the tables, I think it's the same story. Okay. Yeah, I think in the time that was presented, it wasn't possible, at least for me, maybe others saw this, but to see the consistency, that's exactly what I was uh, wondering about is the consistency of, of results on rented in versus rented out. It seemed to me that there were some results that perhaps went in the opposite direction that were expected. Yes. But again, yes. there was so much information that it was difficult to really capture it all in the time. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Rainer, for that, for that, um, for that explanation. Do we have any other, maybe you could go out or let me go into my participant list. Do we have any other, any other questions or comments here? Okay. I don't see any hands. All right, thank you. Well, we will move on then. Um, thank you very much, Rainer, Raul, and the rest of the team. Um, we'll now move on to Mwapata Institute in Malawi. I believe that Kriston Nyondo will be presenting on behalf of the, of the team. We also have Maggie Muntali and Zephania Nyerenda, who are members of the team, and their topic is measuring the heterogeneous effects of input subsidies on household outcomes evidence from Malawi. Big, ongoing, long-term issue in Malawi. Please take it away, Christo. Uh, thank you very much. I hope I can be heard clearly. So the topic has been introduced already and the team working on it um, have also been introduced. And this team uh, from Mother Institute was mentored by uh, uh, Brian Piron and uh, Sergio uh, Preto, both from Cornell University. Okay, so in terms of motivation, um, we are working on a program which started in the 2004-05 season in Malawi, where government introduced a large-scale agriculture subsidy program, um, which uh, is providing 100 programs of uh, fertilizer, both NPK for basal dressing um, for maize and urea for top dressing for maize, and also maize seed, um, for maize it is providing um, access to 10 programs of hybrid maize and um, orientative of seven programs of pollinated varieties. Uh, prior to the 2021 season, it also provided access to legume seed, um, a choice of um, 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 uh, groundnuts, pigeon peas, cow peas, beans, 
and so on. So one of the um, uh, 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 the issues with the program is that, that is that it was not targeting beneficiaries based on age, but it was also it was uh, targeting based on other uh, targeting criteria like um, the resource need and also the uh, income status of households. So our interest is to investigate whether by not uh, considering age, uh, it, it was an important uh, policy oversight. Um, considering that in Malawi, the youth uh, constitute a large share of the population, uh, currently estimated that about two thirds of the population being between um, being between uh, being uh, being less than thirty five years, and also a youth unemployment is very high, and unemployment in general is also very high. So, in terms of our research questions, we are considering two. One, we wanted to find out what extent are the youth participating in the subsidy program. Uh, secondary, what are the effects of the program on the productivity and incomes of households, and whether these are different for uh, older and younger uh, uh, households. And then we have done our analysis using an integrated household panel survey, which um, is, uh, was collected by the National Statistics Office of Malawi with the support of the World Bank and collects a lot of data on agricultural production, household income sources, and other demo, uh, gra uh, demographics at the household level. In terms of our analytical approach, we uh, started by doing a descriptive an analysis, uh, mainly to understand the age dis uh, dis uh, distribution in the program, um, and also to have a deep understanding of the socioeconomic characteristics of the households that are benefiting or that are participating in the program. Um, this was followed by um, a deep dive uh, to understand the relationship between program participation on one hand and household productivity and income on the other. So in terms of the models, we uh, applied a fixed fixed model um, where the dependent variable, um, which in this case is um, YIT on the left hand side was either a productivity or household income where productivity was a composite indicator, um, um, a, a composite monetary value, value um, aggregating um, the monetary value for all um, produce, uh, produce, produced by a particular household, um, and then income, just aggregate income from say, uh, agricultural sources and agricultural uh, sources. And the treatment variable in this case is the first intent variable on the right hand side, the FISIP, which takes the value zero for non beneficiaries, um, one for beneficiaries, and the youth, which uh, takes the value one for households which were in the age category of um, 10 to 35 or zero otherwise. So those within 10 to 35 age category were, uh, were categorized as youth-aided households. And those who were above 35 um, non-youth-aided households. And then the interaction effects between the two and then all other factors as well. And then, uh, because we were interested to see whether uh, participating uh, in the visit, um, the interaction can have can can be uh, have a causal inter interaction. We applied an approach called the 
um, Oster 2019 uh, bias adjustment um, approach where the coefficient estimates can be adjusted um, for uh, potential bias. And so, <clears throat> In, 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 in terms of the OSTA approach, our interest is at the end of the day to estimate um, coefficients which are created for bias. In this case, uh, it, we, we are estimating um, row star on the left hand side, um, while on the right hand side, um, row uh, type is a coefficient uh, from the regression with um, controls and fixed specs. And then the, the row dot was extracted from a regression without any controls except the time and other fixed specs. Um, the R dot was the R which was estimated from regression without controls, the R type was R squared from the regression with controls. And then the R max is a uh, predefined R max, um, which according to the theory presented by Oster, uh, the maximum R max can be set at uh, 1.3 1. 1. times R tide. Um, delta uh, measures the relative importance of the um, unobservable uh, variables in the model versus the variables which were not uh, explicitly represented in the model. Uh, it's, it's the ratio uh, uh, trying to account for the relative importance of unobservables, their effect on the um, estimate. So I just need to explain that. So in terms of our key findings, uh, just try to, as much as possible, um, summarize the key highlights. So in terms of the um, distribution of um, households in the uh, uh, farming to subsidy program, we found that there's no age difference between beneficiaries and non-beneficiaries. However, for those that got recruited into the program, the Nane youth households were more likely to receive coupons for all the inputs that were provided by the program. Um, however, the overall share of beneficiaries receiving the full program uh, fell roughly by uh, 30%. Um, between 2010 and 2019, and these four uh, coincided with the period when government was um, reducing the budget allocations to the program. And um, we further found that uh, the four was sharper for the Nana youth headed households. Um, it was 32% uh, between the 2010 and 2019 period than for the youth headed households, which was around 28% um, um, uh, within that uh, period. We also found that the Nana youth had better access to productive inputs in general terms um, and support services like extension and credit. Uh, this can be clearly seen from the summary, statistic, uh, summary um, uh, statistics. I haven't presented them here. However, um, their access to uh, sorry, okay. However, despite having better access to productive inputs, um, they they are uh, generally um, uh, 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 realized lower outputs for input use. Um, compared with the um, youth-headed households. So uh, what we are seeing is that access to subsidized um, inputs increased 
the relative productivity of the youth more than that of the non youth. So it increased the relative productivity of the youth by about 34%, um, while for the non youth by about 29%. So I'll come to this point later to show you some results. And then the program did not have any significant effect on household incomes for both the youth and non-youth headed households. It only had impact on the uh, relative productivity. So in terms of uh, uh, presenting um, some results uh, relating to uh, participation in the uh, uh, farming for subsidy program and productivity, we find um, that uh, the, there was a positive association between participating in the program and, and the, um, the aggregate productivity. Um, so uh, for the results shown in, in column one, we found that uh, for the model without controls, um, for other farmers, there is a positive but statistically insignificant association between participating um, in the program and uh, changes in their relative productivity. However, the marginal effects for, uh, I mean, the, 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 for, for, for the youth body headed household, there is a positive and a significant um, association um, between them participating in the program and their outputs. When we control for other factors, um, for the results presented in um, quorum two, we find that uh, for the um, for for older farmers, uh, there is a positive association between participating in the FISIP and household productivity. However, what is happening here is that when you control for other factors, the association now becomes significant. Um, for the youth, the association uh, remains significant and remains positive, but becomes even larger in magnitude. So what this suggests is that um, the, our fixed facts model was underestimating our um, results. And then in column um, um, uh, two, um, where youth is taking, um, is a dummy taking the value of one um, for the youth headed households, uh, we find that um, the association for participating in the program is negative. Um, but at, at the difference uh, that the program makes for uh, those who participate and those who don't participate is, is negative. And then after uh, collecting for um, potential bias, we find that uh, for the youth, a, the effect becomes even larger. And even for the nine youth, um, the uh, 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 effect becomes even larger. So, um, um, but the effect is um, even more for the youth than for the non youth. For the income part, we find that, uh, as I've already said, there's no um, significant association between participating in the program and household incomes, regardless of whether it is um, a non youth headed household or a youth headed household. Um, we also find that uh, conditional on receiving an um, a coupon, the share of households that received a fertilizer coupon, in this case, um, a coupon that gave them access to NPK and urea fertilizers, um, it was um, a relative larger um, than for the other. Uh, coupons. So what we're saying is, it seems there was a lot of emphasis on fertilizer, 
uh, in terms of allocating uh, coupons to households and giving them eligibility. Um, so there, I'm just showing you what happened um, for all the four coupons in the program between 2020 and 2019. So for all the years, um, the share of households that received a coupon that gave them access to NPK fertilizers, that is the blue um, uh, bar chart, were always much higher. And also for urea, that's the ones in yellow are much higher uh, relative to say those that received a coupon, a, a coupon for say um, maize or grain legumes. Despite that, there were still variations between them across the years. We also find that uh, the redemption rates for those that received the full program was very high, um, ranging between ninety-eight uh, between eighty-eight and ninety-eight percent. So the group of uh, bar charts on my um, my far left shows you the share of households that received all the four coupons between 2010 and 2019. So we see that um, despite that the share receiving all the four coupons uh, falling steadily across the years, um, 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 we find that in the second group of budgets, um, the actual redemption rates were very high uh, for the households. And then in the next group of budgets, we find that uh, for the households that redeemed, say, fertilizer coupon, um, the redemption rates were still remained very high, between 87 and around 98, 97%. But when you look at the far right, you, we see that uh, the households which were receiving, which were receiving, say, a mass coupon, uh, were much lower relative to those which are redeeming their fertilizer coupons. And also, the households that were redeeming a grain legume coupon were even lower, ranging between um, roughly 4% and 25%. So, um, when we try to look at the factors that could have contributed to this, we think that um, it was in, in, uh, the fact that households were not re uh, redeeming, most households were not redeeming, say, um, fully redeeming their maize coupons or grain legumes coupons. Uh, it, does, it, it does not necessarily mean that uh, they did not receive these coupons, but probably the households uh, prioritized the redemption of um, uh, fertilizer uh, because of their low purchasing power. In terms of policy recommendations, uh, the first recommendation that uh, we um, government could consider uh, uh, providing uh, subsidized inputs, uh, making them available in good time um, so that um, if they are available when farmers are harvesting and selling their produce to mitigate the effect of low purchasing power, improve the targeting of beneficiaries, facilitate access of the youth to productive resources uh, like land, um, credit, and others. And also, um, not only that, but also to incentivize the youth. Um, to redeem and use the coupons which are um, allocated to them. We also see the need for a, the integration of very strong agriculture extension component into the program um, because this will um, uh, continue um, uh, emphasizing the need um, for households to use uh, these improved inputs if they have to improve uh, productivity. And last but not least, a, a raise a need to improve the distribution of coupons to beneficiaries. It looks like the program emphasized too much on um, fertilizer because 
the majority of households or larger share of households receive fertilizer coupons compared to other coupons. So we need to improve, to, to, they, they, they need to consider improving the distribution of um, coupons. Um, that's what I had to share. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Christone. Thank you very much. Um, Edward Marte has present has um, some questions here. I will read them off, and if uh, Edward wants to follow up, that's fine. The first two questions, I think, are one is a question, one is a comment. I think they're they're are along the same lines. He's asking if you can clarify if the outcome is productivity or value of production, and then he states that the topic refers to productivity but the estimation looks at value of production. Um, Chris Stone, any, any, any response to, to that observation? Thank you so much. Yes, so we are looking at productivity, but we are using the value of, the unit value of uh, 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 production. Um, plus the productivity uh, production per, per hectare uh, to circumvent each, um, additive issues, assist a particular household to the program uh, could be provided, say, um, coupons uh, for different um, um, uh, for different crops. And this would vary um, um, significantly across households. And then at the end of the day, it would be very difficult for us to add, um, add to work around productivity for each um, of the crops grown by a household. Uh, that's why we try, we, we focused the uh, productivity with the value of production per hectare as one way of going around the issue of productivity. So in other ways, we are trying to estimate it using the um, productivity um, 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 of each household. Um, if they were, say, to sell the outputs realized from different crop enterprises they were engaged in. Um, I, I, I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, I think that's fine, Chris. So, um, uh, Edward, did you have any follow-up to that or is that sufficient answer? I guess I guess we're fine. Let me- I'm okay, let me... I'm okay with the response. Uh, go ahead, Edward. Yeah, so I said, I'm okay with the, with the response because uh, looking at the, uh, the estimation, yeah, the way you, uh, frame it, it looks more like a value of, you are looking at the production rather than the productivity. Well, I know you can also uh, calculate the value of productivity, but I think maybe making a presentation like that, you have to make it so clear so that whoever is listening to the presentation wouldn't be confused looking at the topic and just opposing that on the, uh, the estimation too as well. Then also, um, I don't know if I can go ahead with the rest of my question. Sure, go ahead, Edward, that's fine. Thank you very much. So. Um, uh, I have this question that a no significant effect on income. Could it be due to the fact that coupons is only driving, I mean, production, but not the value of sales? Because once they produce, they're supposed to sell. So does it mean that the households are getting increase in their production, but not actually selling? Then if that is the case, which categories of households are in your sample? Are they subsistence? Are they semi-commercialized or fully commercialized households? It seems the effect uh, is only driving value of production, but we do not see the distributional effect. So if you have any reaction to this before I followed up with the rest of the question. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much. So the program is targeting uh, subsistence farmers, subsistence farmers, um, subsistence farmers. Um, these are the farmers who are very poor, and in most cases, they are, um, 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 they, 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 they only produce at subsistence level. They don't produce enough 
for the market. So the inputs provided to them, F150 kg bag of um, NPK, 150 kg bag of um, urea, just help them to boost up, um, up, up their product production a little bit, but that would not be enough to take to the market. Uh, yeah, so basically it is targeting subsistence. So maybe I wasn't very clear in my presentation, I was supposed to lay out all those issues. So it's very, very clear. Yeah, thank you very much. I think, yes, that, that makes sense. Then that is why you're having that effect. Yes, so once they are subsistence, then I think, yeah, then you need to make that uh, uh, argument very strongly in your presentation so that, I mean, whoever is listening to the presentation, I mean, will know that definitely these are subsistence, I mean, farmers, and that is why uh, nothing, I mean, we don't see much effect in terms of the income. Okay, so now the issue of targeting, it is a general problem, especially um, in, in Africa, especially when there is an intervention and, you know, you want to make sure that we target the right people. You also mentioned that in your conclusion, and I want to find out uh, that when you say that we should improve, I mean, targeting of beneficiaries, uh, what, what specifically are you referring to? Is it an issue of data or what? Uh, it's an issue of giving the inputs to the right beneficiaries in the sense that um, the when you look at a program like a, a pro, um, an agricultural input subsidy program, um, it is trying to mitigate one major constraint uh, for households. That is, it is assuming that all the households, they are productive in this, that maybe they have the land and also the labor to um, be able to productively utilize the inputs that they receive from the program. But um, in reality, things don't work like that. Sometimes um, households which receive the inputs, they are not necessarily the uh, productive, house, productive households. Yes, they are subsistent. Yes, they are poor. They are resource poor, but they may not have enough labor. So if you, um, if, if, if you read in our paper, you'll see that uh, when, when you try to understand how were the uh, coupons being distributed, you'll see that there was a very clear uh, social influence in the way beneficiaries were being targeted, you will see that uh, some of the beneficiaries were put in the program, maybe because they were um, widows or they were widowers, um, or because they were categorized as a households from say, a, from within the vulnerable group of households. It's not because they will utilize those or they are deemed to be able to utilize those inputs. Um, uh, very productive. So we think that uh, the program should, as much as possible, try to target those households who have land and they can also have enough labor to uh, be able to productively utilize the inputs and not just because of some other social considerations. Thank you very much. I think I'll end it here. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. <clears throat> any other questions? I don't see any hands up. Raul, Raul, you just put your video on. Did you have a question? No, no, I don't have any question. Okay. Okay, well, look, we have a bit more time. So, um, Crystal, I'm gonna ask you to step a bit out of what you can say um, based on your particular analytical results and ask you a broader policy question. There's a lot of poverty in Malawi. It's especially concentrated in rural areas. Um, the government spends quite a lot of money on the fertilizer subsidies, um, despite the apparent reduction in coverage um, in recent years. And you're finding that uh, while it has 
an overall significant effect on, on production um, or productivity. It has no impact of any kind on income. And I'm assuming, I didn't catch your, your answer to that, but I'm, I'm assuming that you included consumed own production in income, right? You could cl please clarify that. But, but if you're really having no impact at all on the in overall incomes of poor rural households with this program, would you continue, would you recommend just on the merits, not taking into account right now the political economy, would you recommend continuation of the program or not? And if you would recommend it, why would you recommend it? Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for, for your question. Um, it's a difficult question. Um, and since you have um, um, uh, put uh, some sort of a disclaimer on it to say, without considering the political economy issues, um, does the program make sense? And therefore, do you recommend it? Um, maybe let me start by saying that uh, when you look at the uh, guidelines for the programs that were implemented within the review period of 2010 and 2019, you, it, it becomes very clear uh, to, 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 to to, 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 to say that uh, the objectives, the objective of the program was too compounded, okay? So you have one, one program targeting to improve productivity, to improve in, household incomes, to also improve household nutrition. And um, in this program, you treat households as a homogeneous group. I think to me, that's where the problem starts. If we are able to say, to, I mean, to um, disentangle the heterogeneity of farmers and come up with a subsidy program that targets beneficiaries, agricultural, households that have the real need for the inputs, they have the necessary land, they have the labor, but they're on a constraint in terms of accessing the inputs to use on that land. Um, if that was possible, I would say, I think then there'll be merits for continuing the program to target only that category of farmers, uh, but to also use it as say a social safety net, um, uh, I, I don't think it would work very well um, because I don't think this type of program um, would be well designed to address the income needs of households. So maybe some households at the end of the day would be better suited in a different program than this program. But a certain, uh, 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 share of agricultural households, I think would need to be supported um, uh, um, for them to be boosted in terms of their productivity. And then maybe later on, they can graduate and be weaned off, uh, off uh, the program. Um, uh, I think that's the longer version of the answer to, to your question. Okay, thanks, Crystal. Yeah, I think that that's a, that was a thoughtful response, and it's a very the political economy is in, of this in Malawi is uh, is obviously, as you know, very, very, very complicated. I hope you have had or will have the chance to kind of present these results to some key policymakers and perhaps have a discussion with them about what the what the implications are for 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 design. You you wouldn't be the first one trying to do that, but Mopata being a local organization, um, you all Malawian researchers having done this research, um, it might have more, more weight uh, with a policymaker coming, coming from you all. 
Okay, do we have any more questions? Any more questions? Any more comments? Please raise your hand or please speak up. I don't see any hands. Okay. Um, there's well, a couple of, uh, there's I'm a sorry. couple of, there's a couple of comments in the question and answer. Okay, there was one comment, sure, value of own consumption, sure. And okay. And so that was that was kind of in response to Christone's um Christone's response to Edward's question. And then we have an anonymous attendee indicating based on the agricultural household model, it, I, I assume this person means the program, kind of solves the consumption constraint in terms of supply or food diversity. I don't know. And I would I would opine, I'm not sure it shows that, but um, but then they say that I it but seems I would recommend continuation of the policy. Yeah. Um I don't know if whoever made that comment would want to expound it at all on it. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I think we'll we'll come to a close now. I'm gonna just, just thank you all for this. Um, but before closing, uh, Chris, do you have any comments you would like to make? Yeah, Dave, I just wanted to congratulate all three teams on incredibly successful STARS Plus projects. These were really interesting topics, and it was truly a pleasure to watch the evolution of your thinking and your findings on this, and a, and a real pleasure to get to hear your presentations today. So congratulations to each of those teams, and thanks to Dave and your team at MSU and to USAID for support for the STARS Plus program. And a special shout out to Kelsey Schreiber, who runs the STARS Plus program on a day-to-day -day basis and has really enabled the success of this and all the other STARS Plus teams. Thanks. Yeah, okay, thank you, Chris. Yeah, and thank you, Kelsey. Um, yes, I would reiterate that, what Chris has said. Um, STARS Plus has been a very important program in PRCI. I think the, the level of mentoring that goes on and beyond the mentoring, the level of teamwork that I see that goes on uh, uh, in receiving feedback, learning, um, to really respond seriously to that feedback, to engage your mentors, to go back and forth. And as Chris said, to through that process for your thinking to evolve and for the papers to evolve. It's really fantastic experience, really strengthens the capacity in, in all of these centers and of you all as individuals. Um, and we're very pleased to have it here. And we know that, that a, a number of you sitting as you do, well, all of you sitting as you do in local organizations, right? Some of which are very involved in policy, right? In the end, PRCI is trying to influence at least the thinking of policymakers about what they are doing, right? So I would just encourage you all, and I know that this has been a topic um, in some of the sessions that you had under the STARS Plus program about bringing this to bear on policy deliberations in your countries, right? So I would really encourage you all, even as you reach the end of your STARS Plus program in this phase of the research and you're getting it published in peer review, to really kind of distill your lessons, put some effort into developing presentations that really do focus on the policy. And as I said to about one of the presentations that kind of boil down the results in a way that's understandable, and will resonate with policymakers um, and push forward with that. Um, you don't have to stop your work on this or your use of the results of what you've what you've generated simply because the Stars Plus program is coming to an end. And I really, I really hope that you don't. So with that note, thank you very much again. Um, excellent presentations, excellent research. Thank you to Chris, thank you to Kelsey, thank you to all the mentors, and thank you, of course, to the researchers for the effort you put in over the past uh, 15 or 18 months. Everybody have a good day. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Stay well.